welcome Professor Miriam Schlesinger. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria, for everything that you have done to make my uh, to make the whole process so smooth and, and wonderful. And, and thank you to the rest of the organizing committee, to Adriana, to Evelyn, to Jennifer, and to Anna, and to uh, Professor Klintovich as well, whom I had the honor of meeting this morning. I'd also like to thank uh, Principal McRoberts, I don't know if he's still here, but for, for the welcome and personally to thank, thank Professor Candice Seguino who has been my personal hospitality and welcome committee and has, has, uh, has shown me around and has been uh, simply wonderful. And thank you all of you for this very, very warm welcome. I'm very moved and touched and excited to be here. I arrived two days ago, I leave tomorrow, but this will remain etched in my memory as a it's an incredibly memorable experience. I'm overwhelmed by the strong impression of how well a group of students can put together such a complex matter as a conference. I've organized quite a few conferences, and it is invariably one of those occasions where the unpredictable is as predictable as possible. Um, things happen. And we just saw that happen now. Someone inadvertently touched the keyboard and put up one of my worst slides. It was sitting there for about 10 minutes, and everyone politely kind of ignored it. And it just happened. And that's just the way things go at conferences. But if you take it in your stride and with a smile, OK, so it happens. And, and you move on. And everyone here seems to take things in their stride, which is fantastic. On a somewhat different note, I'd just like to say I was quite well acquainted with Professor Daniel Sinomi, whom I had the great honor and privilege of knowing over a period of several years. He visited Israel quite frequently, so that we also had several personal um, visits. Um, he was an inspiration, both intellectually and personally, in his kindness, in his depth and insights, in the outstanding his outstanding contributions, I need not elaborate, uh, his 1998 landmark article and many things uh, before that, and, and have, have generated so much, have, been, have had such a wonderful ripple effect in interpreting studies, and we are still continuing to study his legacy today. And it is a particular personal privilege to be here at an event which is dedicated in part to, to his memory. Uh, and finally, I'd like to explain that my choice of um, the notion of usefulness, which of course I'll be explaining in the course of my presentation, but I'd just like to say that we are constantly challenged, at least where I come from, and I think throughout the academic world today, we are challenged to prove that we're doing something useful. We're challenged to prove that we're doing something relevant. We're challenged to prove that we're not just engaged in navel gazing and uh, silent meditation, but actually contributing something to humanity. And while that challenge may be questionable, it's out there, and we have to respond to it. And that's why I think the notion of usefulness is one that we have to come to grips with and somehow show that we are making a contribution, which doesn't mean that everything that we do has to have an immediate practical application. But it does mean that somehow, in the long run, it should have some relevance to the real world. And this is basically the theme that I'd like to explore in the context of interpreting studies. My, I, I do translation and I do translation studies in general. I did start with interpreting studies. But in recent years, I've come to specialize, in fact, in over the past 20 years, I've come to specialize in interpreting and the analysis of interpreting, which is an enormously varied field. So I guess I'll get started with my talk. I have, let me see, it is now 10 o'clock. I have until, um, I forgot, um, 11.15 or 11 o'clock. 10.45. 10.45. Wow. Uh, well, what do you say? OK, fine. I just need my bearing. Sorry about that. Right. So let's get started. First of all, as I said, interpreting is an enormously varied field. It's varied in the manner in which it's practiced. 
It can be in an international organization, or as you saw at length earlier, it can be behind the scenes in your slippers just sitting there reading the interpreting for someone <laughs> up, up front, which is kind of a rather informal but nonetheless professional form of interpreting. It can be out in the field in some kind of um, ad hoc community interpreting or in military interpreting or interpreting in times of um, um, uh, major events like earthquakes and so on, where suddenly a lot of interpreting is needed into a variety of languages. It can be in the healthcare settings. It can be a sign language interpreter who is using the same kind of setting, a conference, but a different modality, the sign or visual modality. Uh, or it can be a sign language interpreter using remote interpreting, where now, because of modern technology, sign language can be done remotely using whether it's a small phone or a larger screen. All of these are forms of interpreting uh, which exist and which those of us who study interpreting must take into account when we speak about this highly varied form of interlingual mediation. And finally, of course, you'll probably recognize two of the people in this slide. You may not recognize the guy in the middle, but in fact, again, this is where interpreters also uh, do their thing. So clearly, as you see, it's a highly varied practice. Not only is it highly varied in terms of the settings and the uh, types of uh, discourse that are handled, it's also highly varied in terms of the output. And that's what makes it so difficult to study. If someone were to interpret me now, let's say, into French, or if you had five interpreters here all interpreting me into French, and you then transcribe the French output, you have five very different outputs. So that it's true, of course, in the translation as well, but it's no less true in interpreting. Here's an example of a sentence. You don't need to worry about the source text, but you just look at four <coughs> interpreting, four outputs of the very same input sentence. You don't need to read it. You just look at it, and you see that the fourth one is more than double in length, the first, let alone the second. And these are the outputs of four professional interpreters who interpreted this sentence as part of a much longer speech. So you see how highly varied it is. Now, how do you study an object that is as varied as this, both in terms of the settings and in terms of the discourse patterns and the manner in which the interpreter processes the input? And this is basically what I want to talk about. The first um, quarter or third of my talk will be uh, more about um, the process and product of interpreting in general, because after all, interpreting in a way is an extension or a subcategory of translation, and we first want to understand what really goes on, what goes on in the mind, which I suppose we'll never fully understand, but this is part of what we'd like to understand. After I talk about the process and product for, let's say, about 10 minutes, I will focus, and this will be the, the bulk of my talk, I will focus on interpreting as uh, socially situated practice um, and the whole issue of community interpreting, healthcare interpreting, court interpreting, and so on. And I also want to leave some time for questions if that becomes feasible. So first let's talk very briefly, really very briefly, just some vignettes about the process and the product because we can't talk about a socially situated practice without also asking ourselves what is going on here? What happens when a speech goes into your head and you emit it, you, 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 you uh, produce it in a target language in a coherent and fluent manner, more or less accurately? How does this happen? Clearly, this also has implications for cognitive psychology, for psycholinguistics, for um, even for clinical psychology indirectly, and I'll explain that perhaps later. And for linguistics and for discourse analysis and for conversation analysis. In other words, we can learn from interpreting a lot about other uh, processes. So let's look at a few kinds of questions. Are these questions useful? And I'm not going to dwell on any of them, just giving some examples. How can we really understand what happens? And if we do understand, can we then do it better? And what does it take to make a good interpreter? Students often ask that. You know, they have their language as well, but they're too shy, or they have some kind of um, slowness in their retrieval of words, and they find it very frustrating, and eventually they give up. So what does it take to make a good interpreter? And what factors make for optimal performance? And what factors will impede performance? And do our listeners understand us as well as the listeners of the original speaker understand her? 
That's a big question. And in fact, in one study that was done, it was shown that the intonation of interpreters, if you've ever, many of you have listened to interpreters, somehow the intonation of interpreters is a bit weird. It isn't quite the same as normal intonation. And it has been shown that because people are listening to an intonation that's a tiny bit off, they understand less than they would if the intonation were totally natural. So can we teach people to produce a more natural intonation? That is quite a challenge. Those are things that we ask. And is it something that can be taught altogether? Are you simply, are interpreters simply born rather than made? All of these are questions which are useful or relevant in the sense that we are, after all, in an institution that trains translators and in the future, hopefully, also interpreters. And these questions uh, will provide an infrastructure for deciding whether it's worth doing and whether it can be done effectively. So, um, I'd like to cite very briefly um, my colleague from Vienna, Professor Franz Kochhacker, who points out that what we want to do is to learn about interpreting in its different modes, modes are like executive and simultaneous, or modalities, the spoken and the uh, manual, as an object of study at the intersection of language, communication, cognition, and culture, and to figure out the questions because this is an epistemological need. We have to know what it is we want to know. We have to define the object, and then we have to ask ourselves, what are the questions we're going to ask about that object? This is the epistemological challenge. So what are some of the questions, the psychocognitive, the social, the pragmatic, the ideological, the pedagogical, that will allow us to study it? And uh, Franz also says, if the epistemological rationale is not convincing enough, in our increasingly utilitarian economicized world, we need to ask what kind of a market there is for our output. How much of our research will inform and shape professional practices? So we're back to the usefulness paradigm. We want to see whether it's all going to be useful, so we're not just waxing lyrical about the beauty of interpreting, but we're really saying something about how it can be taught and how it can be done more effectively. If I'm going to interpret for two dignitaries who are communicating with one another, and I don't do it effectively, the communication is going to fall flat. So there is a direct relevance, of course, to this effectiveness. So what I'm going to do now is just show you a few typical questions that we ask. As we try to tease apart the following issue. What is interpreting? And one produces a certain output. And in that output, we notice some flaw. Is that flaw the result of choosing a strategy that will help me to survive as I continue to interpret? Is that flaw the result of norms, which basically say, forget about the adjectives, you can leave them out, or don't worry about pronunciation, that's not an issue. That's kind of a norm which says, yes, it's flawed, but that's OK. Or is it perhaps a cognitive constraint? I made that mistake because I couldn't handle everything that was coming in at that speed. So teasing apart strategies, norms, and cognitive constraints is one of the big issues in interpreting studies in general. So here's an example, a sentence in a text that was used in an experiment. The promotion of ecological and economic, economic research has become one of the most promising areas of cooperation between countries in the troubled Middle East. 16 interpreters did this experiment. 13 of them left out the word troubled. Now clearly that's a flaw, because omitting a word that the original speaker has said is less than accurate. I think that's unarguable. So we ask, why would 13 people out of 16 omit this word? Is it a strategy? In other words, I'm conserving energy because this is overwhelming and, and who cares about adjectives anyway? Or is it a norm which basically says it's okay to cheat a little bit and to leave out a few words and so on? Or is it simply that they couldn't handle it? It's a cognitive constraint. Any, any theories? Can I throw it open to the floor for a moment? Why would they leave it out? Yes? Perhaps it's assumed that Middle East is already troubled, so they omitted it because it's a more of a fact. OK, in other words, unless you just landed from Mars yeah. an hour ago, you know, you know that the Middle East is troubled, and therefore this is redundant information. And the norm would say, if it's redundant information, it's OK to leave it out. OK. Any other ideas? Yes. I don't know, it could have a, an ideological uh, dimension in that, depending on what language it's going into, it, it troubled to, to label the Middle East as troubled in that way 
might have been viewed by the interpreters as uh, uncomfortable. Okay, the interpreter might see this as uncomfortable. Of course, the answer to that may be, yes, but the original speaker used the word. Is the interpreter there to censor the words of the original speaker, or should the interpreter simply reproduce? You know, let the interpreter uh, the original speaker bear the consequences if someone wants to say that he has offended the audience. But I mean, I'm not arguing with you. I mean, this is just kind of a, a polemic. So these are two typical reasons. The third reason might be that perhaps the word trouble is a little difficult to translate it or to interpret it to. In, to some languages, at least, it doesn't have a convenient one word equivalent. So it could, there could be various uh, explanations. And these are the kinds of things that we research. Now, why is this useful? It's useful because then we can teach students how to cope with such things. Or we can teach them, you know what, don't worry about it. If you need to leave out a word that's obviously redundant, leave it out. We have to decide what we're going to teach. But that's the useful application of it. And for psychologists, it can be useful in saying, aha, when interpreters work, they instinctively leave out the adjective. They didn't leave out the word Middle East. They didn't leave out the word countries. They all left out the word trouble, which means that in terms of the hierarchy of linguistic uh, elements, there seems to be something wired into our brains as to how we prioritize them. Yes? Uh, could you agree that perhaps the word, uh, the, um, uh, the word our trouble will in, you know, elicit uh, personal involvement in that, and that is why it's left out. But the word our doesn't appear in the original. Yeah, because it's our trouble in the Middle East. Uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't belong, you know, like, but there isn't no one to acknowledge that they have But the word our doesn't appear in the original text. It's the trouble in the Middle East. But anyway, if, it, if there had been the word our, it could have been even more so. But the word, in fact, in the original text is the, so that that um, it doesn't seem to be quite the, the case. In any case, it, it, that also could be an explanation. Let's look at another typical problem. When interpreters work with words, they could reproduce 82%, 81.8% of everything correctly, says one study from Italy. But when they have numbers, 54%. <laughs> Why are the numbers botched up so extensively? That's almost half the numbers get botched up. And not only are the numbers botched up, but they also uh, are a problem trigger so that what follows is very often botched up as well. You're so preoccupied with, was it millions or billions? Was it 7,000 or 17,000? So you get the whole remainder of the sentence wrong. Those are the kinds of things where you're not quite sure if it's cognitive constraints, which basically means you weren't concentrating, you weren't able to do everything all at once, or norms or strategies. Um, then there's the whole issue of remote interpreting. How well do we do when we're interpreting from a different room or even from a different country and using just a video monitor or some form of remote technology? This is a big issue, by the way, and I deliberately brought, brought this quote, which is from 1957, the first MA thesis ever written about interpreting, was written in English. And you see that already back in 1957, they were talking about remote interpreting as a very neat and obvious use of interpreters. Well, the jury is still out on whether uh, remote interpreting is good or bad or... I mean, it's obviously um, a, a, a necessity because as um, travel becomes costly, as international organizations have 20 or more languages to accommodate, for all sorts of reasons, we need remote interpreting. Is it good or bad? Well, it's here to stay, so let's see how we can do it better, and this is a whole topic on yourself, which I'm not going into, but I just again want to demonstrate the usefulness, because at the European Parliament, for example, they commissioned a very costly study to show whether remote interpreting works, whether the quality of the output is the same as if the interpreter were present in the room, and whether it has any detrimental effect on the health or hearing or headaches or whatever of the interpreters. So that is a very tangible usefulness. Another study by my colleague Franz Kurschacher again. Quite a surprising study. Three teams of highly professional interpreters all working, interpreting a US presidential debate from English into German. And as soon as they hit acronyms and abbreviations, which are highly specialized, they're very specifically American, even these superstars of interpreting, I mean, the best interpreters in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, as you see, did not score impressively well. And you could see that in some cases they did, none of them knew the answer. 
And all in all, they ranged between 10% and 35% accuracy, which is nothing to write home about. So here, I would say it's not strategies, it's not norms, it's not cognitive constraints, it's simply world knowledge, or world knowledge of Americana in this particular case. And another issue that often comes up when we discuss interpreting as a process is how do we evaluate quality? What is good interpreting? After all, interpreting, like translation, is a product, it is a process, it is a service, and it is an adjunct of the source text. It has to resemble the source text. So it's very difficult to know how to evaluate interpreting, and this is clearly one of the most useful applications we can have as researchers, how to make it better and how to show that it's really, really good or not as the case may be. So, that was just a tiny, tiny insight into um, process and product from the cognitive vantage point, the kinds of questions that come up. Obviously, there are dozens and dozens of studies in many, many other directions, but this was just kind of to put the appetite. I also want to mention briefly the translation studies, the interpreting studies interface in order to drive home the point that we can infer a great deal from interpreting to know more about translation. I know that most of the people here deal with translation, written translation, rather than oral interpreting. So you might say, well, why do I want to know about interpreting? After all, I'm not going to do interpreting. I'm not going to study interpreting. Well, there's a lot in interpreting that can shed light on what happens in translation. They are basically the same process, only performed under different sets of constraints. So for example, first of all, just to cite another authority, Professor Daniel Gilles of France, he points out that translation and interpreting share so much, and the differences can help shed light on each, so that besides investigating their respective features, each step in the investigation of one can contribute valuable input, input towards investigation of the other. Okay, so basically, um, they are very closely interrelated. And I'd like to show you a few studies, some of you may be familiar with these, from Denmark, in which um, eye tracking technology was used to demonstrate, and it demonstrates very uh, interestingly, the proximity between translation and interpreting. What you see here in the slide is um, an eye tracking chart. I don't know how many of you have ever seen these, but basically the big dots are a fixation where the gaze, I mean, you have a translator or a reader sitting there with goggles where you have this kind of camera that follows the eye movements of the translator as he or she translates on a computer, in this case just reading, not even translating. And the eye tracker tracks every movement of the pupils of the eyes, and these big blue dots are when the eye stops. You know, when we read, of course, we read, and then we stop, and when we read, and we stop. Sometimes we look back, sometimes we jump forward. So you see that in this particular uh, case, basically it's going forward very linearly. You have one case at the very bottom line where suddenly it jumps all the way back to the top. Perhaps the reader was just checking the name of the article. But basically it's linear, and this is how we read. And we dwell on specific words along the way, which I won't go into now, but this is what they were looking at. However, when we're reading for translation, of course we fixate a lot longer, and we jump back and forth a lot more. So it goes this way. And when we're reading for sight translation, which as you know means that I have a text in front of me, and I'm not using a computer, I'm just reading it so to speak, in another language, in the target language, I'm basically doing simultaneous interpreting, only I'm setting the speed myself rather than having it being set uh, in an audio modality. Um, when we're doing sight translation, this is what it looks like. Okay, so clearly there is something to, there, you can show a kind of progression as you move in the direction of interpreting, from reading to translation to interpreting. I'm not going to analyze this. This is the work done at, at the Copenhagen Business School by a team of researchers who are focused on translation studies, not really interpreting studies, but also interpreting studies, because they constantly find overlaps between the two. The usefulness, as far as they're concerned, lies in the cognitive processes. And in fact, some of their papers have been published not only in translation studies journals, but in journals, well, some journals of um, psychology, some journals of psycholinguistics, some journals of discourse analysis, so that the usefulness and the interdisciplinarity, uh, I think, are, are quite self-evident. And just one more study to talk about the interface, and then I'll move on to the next section. Uh, a doctoral student of mine and I once did a study in which we took 24,000 words 
a spoken, original spoken language, like I'm speaking now. It's a, a semi-scripted, or not really scripted, but a, a semi-formal speech, let's say. Uh, 24,000 words of translation and 24,000 words of interpreted discourse. Original translation and interpreted discourse. We studied many, many features of these outputs. They were all into the same language, which was Hebrew, and all in the same genre, the same domain, more or less, and so on. And we found that in the original speech, there were 80 cases of the passive voice. In the written translation, there were 120. And in the simultaneous interpreting, there were 138. I haven't the slightest idea why. It's one of these things that I'd like to study. But the very fact that you do the comparison between original translation and interpreting, and you find marked differences, must be telling you something. Something about the process, something about the product, something about the service, whatever. Are you using the passive to create a distance from the subject? Does the interpreter use the passive because he doesn't really know what the agent is, so you're kind of playing it safe and you're just saying, it was done without knowing whom it was done, who it was done by, whom it was done by, um, and, and so on. These are things that we can ask and we can learn from translation about interpreting and, and so on. So these are some of the aspects of the interface, which I'm stressing because I know most of you do translation studies. There's a lot more of a proximity between translation and interpreting than we seem to realize. <laughs> now I'd like to talk about the social dimension of interpreting, which is the focus, really, of this conference and of, um, of what I hope to be presenting. I'm starting out top-down. Top-down basically means, before we talk about interpreters, who pays for them, who trains them, how good they are, where they work, uh, what, kinds of, um, what kinds of recognition they get, and all the details, what um, codes of ethics they have, what codes of practice, and so on. Before we talk about any of that, if we want to look at it from the top down, we have to look at it in terms of language policy. Language policy is bigger than any of us. It's bigger than a translation school or an interpreting program. It's all about how the powers that be, the policy makers at the highest levels, and those in charge of the purse strings of the, of the budgets, um, look at language, and at language rights, and at signs, and at what languages are taught. I don't need to tell you, you know about this. I know language policy is a hot issue in Canada, as it is in many, many, many other places. But it certainly has immediate effects when it comes to interpreting, and that's why I'm starting top down. So whenever you talk about language policy, from Schiffman's well-known uh, picture, most of it is covert. In other words, most of the policy is never really stated. It's just, it's there. But nobody has stated it. Maybe 10% is in the form of actual statements, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, United Nations, 1948, where they state explicitly that everyone's entitled to rights uh, without distinction of blah, 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 including language, or a fair and public hearing, which implies that you have to be able to hear what's, to understand what's going on, and medical care and social services. These are explicit, overt statements of language policy. But in fact, as uh, Stephen Kangas and Philipson of uh, Denmark, uh, who are kind of the gurus of language rights and so on, tell us, while discrimination based on religion, gender, or race is generally condemned, language is commonly and increasingly used as a criterion for denying immigration, asylum, citizenship, voting, employment, etc. But this language plays a much bigger role in human rights than many of us um, recognize or want to recognize. So. I just want to bring you one example which I find particularly remarkable. You know that in the case of signed languages, um, deaf children, if a child is born deaf, um, to hearing parents, 90% of all deaf children have hearing parents. So that the whole concept of mother tongue is a very um, controversial topic in that case because the mother's language is one that the child cannot hear and therefore cannot understand. So that the whole concept of the case of deaf children is very um, controversial, controversial and complicated. I won't go into detail about all this, but the reason I'm mentioning this is that in terms of language policy, here's an example. 1880 in Milan, the International Congress of Educators for the Deaf, passed a resolution which renew, removed the use of sign languages from education for the deaf and prevented deaf citizens, etc. I won't read the whole thing. The point is that in terms of language policy, an international organization devoted to educating deaf children told deaf children, if you dare to sign, we'll tie your hands behind your back. That's what they actually did. 
if children sign. Now, for deaf children, signing is the only natural language. Reading lips and so on is, is, is extraordinarily difficult and frustrating and often uh, impossible. So that, in effect, this kind of language policy deprived the users of the language from the most basic right of all, the right to communicate. Interestingly, only uh, 130 years later, 2010 in Vancouver, the organizing committee opened the Congress with a sweeping repudiation of the 1880 Milan resolutions. The resolutions had banned sign language, resulting in deprivation of access to quality education and minimal equality in life for deaf citizens all over the world. So what we see is in 1880 we have a language policy that is outrageous, but it prevailed for 130 years. 130 years later, finally, just two years ago, here in Canada, it was officially uh, repudiated, and not only was it repudiated, they rejected all the resolutions, sincerely regret the detrimental effects of the Milan Conference. So 130 years later, we apologize, and we call upon all nations in the world to remember history and ensure that educational programs accept and respect all languages and all forms of communication. So it's interesting, sociologically, um, and in terms of human rights, it takes a very, very long time for these things to happen. But eventually, language policy, as a function of human rights policy and, and other aspects of politics, uh, comes uh, changes. Another thing that we could usefully research would be what happens when we don't have an interpreter or when we don't have translation. For instance, uh, at one NGO in Israel where we have many refugees who come in for, for treatment or for diagnosis, uh, some of them speak a language which nobody on the staff speaks and there are no volunteers who speak those languages. And what they use are things like this kind of a card. Now what happens when you have this kind of a card? How much communication can there possibly be? Obviously, um, it's extremely limited and often even misleading. Because many of these signs, although the graphic artist has certainly done their best to produce something understandable, many of these signs can be interpreted in various ways. And of course, you, you don't have a sign that says, are you allergic to penicillin? Right? I mean, there's a sign that says, uh, would you like a toothbrush? That's fine and well. But the more um, complex interactions are not represented in these signs. So obviously, you don't even need research to prove that unmediated communication, unmediated communication doesn't go very far. By the same token, a study that was done by a doctor in Israel with um, Amharic speakers, immigrants from Ethiopia, asked the Amharic speakers, did you understand the dietitian's instructions? Now she's an endocrinologist and she was studying diabetics, people with diabetes. If the diabetic person doesn't understand the dietitian's instructions, there are problems obviously, because it's all about food monitoring and so on. And you see that the control group, which is people who spoke the language, 98% of them understood the dietitian's instructions, whereas among the immigrants, 45% understood, which means that over half of them did not understand, which means that over half of them may or may not do what the dietitian asked them to do, and may or may not get sicker. And the reason she conducted this study is she noticed that so many of them were coming back in worse shape than uh, when she had last seen them. So obviously something was wrong, and she discovered that it had a lot to do with understanding either the dietitian or the pharmacist, where again, you see that only 18% of the immigrants who did not speak the local language, 18% understood the pharmacist, and um, all of the rest either understood a small portion or understood nothing. I suppose it's interesting that among the Hebrew speakers, only 80% understood, which means that 20% of the population don't understand the pharmacist even they do speak the language, which is food for thought, but I won't go into that. Uh, anyway, so this is unmediated com uh, communication. And as a result of this study, which was quite, uh, quite um, mind-blowing, um, this doctor set up an NGO that provides telephone interpreting from Hebrew to Amharic and from Amharic to Hebrew, and now serves about 130 clinics throughout the country. So this is a very good example of Research, where she had nothing to do with interpreting, she's a physician in a hospital, which has proven enormously useful in the most fundamental way to the immigrant community and to those who are supposed to be providing medical care to that community. 130 clinics, day in and day out, provide interpreting over the phone 
through the service, which sits in an office in the middle of the country where there are only three employees who sit at the phone all day and answer phone calls and interpret from Amharic into Hebrew and from Hebrew into Amharic. And it's changed the face of medicine for that particular population. Let's talk about the usefulness of researching conflicting perceptions and fuzzy goal boundaries. This leads us, I'm kind of moving top down into uh, the area of community interpreting, where those of you who have any experience with community interpreting know that uh, uh, alongside ethical issues, the issue of fuzzy role boundaries and conflicting perceptions of what you're allowed to do, what you're supposed to do, and so on, are perhaps the most <coughs> painful and complex challenges to the interpreter. So I'd like to present to you with some examples and uh, a few slides from now. I'll get to some examples which come from a course that I've been teaching for the past six years, in which what we did was we opened the course for any student at the university, not in the translation department, any department, any degree, any anything, who speaks a minority language, which in the case of my country is Arabic usually, uh, Russian, or Amharic, occasionally Spanish, but those are the four, uh, the three or four main languages that we <coughs> provide. And any student, any degree, any anything, who is willing to take this course, it's an elective, but what they have to do is they have to give 100 hours of volunteer service at an NGO or a hospital or some setting uh, where they can help uh, the minority language population. But before I get to that, I'm just going to mention that those of you who are interested in this in greater depth, in the book by my colleague Franz Buschacher, he discusses this at great, at great length. I don't have time to go into it, but he basically talks about the shift, the gradual shift from the left side, which is more about conference interpreting, with its uh, prestige and its uh, very typical um, settings in the direction of uh, um, community interpreting, also known as community-based interpreting, also known as dialogue interpreting, also known as liaison interpreting, also known as public service interpreting, whatever you call it, that's the shift. And those of you who are more interested will look at this 2004 book. I, I'm not going to go into it, but it's, it's a very important uh, discussion of the topic, that's why I wanted to mention it. So, one of the biggest issues that we want to discuss is neutrality. When I started teaching this course, I was going on about how you must be neutral. You must be neutral, you are the interpreter, you're not there to add, or you're not there to take away, you're not there to make him sound nicer or kinder or smarter or whatever. You're not there to advocate, you're there to interpret, and that's it. And indeed, if you look at the Code of Ethics, the first Code of Ethics, 1965, the, um, it's the, the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf in the United States. He shall remember the limits of his particular function and not go beyond his responsibility. But what is his particular function and what is his responsibility? That is not defined. And then a, a drastic shift for me ideologically, but it didn't happen overnight, it was a very gradual shift. When I started reading various philosophers and various um, ideologues, such as Paulo Freire from Brazil, who wrote the book uh, Pedagogy of Oppression and various other books mostly devoted to the area of teaching and how teachers of the teaching institution can manipulate and exploit power and perpetuate power imbalances. A kind of Marxist philosophy, basically. Ferris says, washing one's hands of the conflict between the powerful and the powerless means to side with the powerful, not to be neutral. Now that's a very heavy statement. It basically says you think you're being neutral, but you're not. If you're being neutral, you're actually helping the clerk or the doctor or the judge because the other guy who doesn't speak the language is already at such a disadvantage that unless you reduce the disadvantage a little bit, in effect, you are perpetuating the power imbalance. And that's very political. This is no longer interpreting studies in the sense of what goes on in the brain as we interpret. It's, it has many ramifications sociologically, ideologically, politically, and so on. And it left me very confused because the students kept saying, should I be neutral? Should I help? Shouldn't I help? Should I add? Shouldn't I add? The patient said something really wrong. Should I correct it or shouldn't I correct it? The patient said something against the doctor. Should I repeat it or should I shut up? So these are issues that come up all the time. They're not just hypothetical. And indeed, on many of the discussion lists on the uh, internet and beyond, 
where um, interpreters, community interpreters, particularly healthcare interpreters, have these long discussions about norms and ethics and conflicts and so on. One of the leading people in that profession in the United States, uh, Marjorie Bancroft writes, an interpreter has every right to set aside neutrality when that is clearly, in her conscience and professional experience, the right thing to do. That's called advocacy. And it's a matter of the interpreter clearly identifying her role at the given point of time. Now, you can agree or you can disagree, but clearly there is a dilemma here. There is something to think about. By the same token, in Chinese, this is from an article about Chinese, uh, one of the interpreters says, when the doctor said death, death, I would avoid using the word. I would use letting go, sleeping, stop eating rice. <laughs> okay. Which is charming. I don't know Chinese. I don't know if it's, you know, what they really use. But it totally makes sense, doesn't it? So these are digressions, or should I say changes, or shifts in the translation output that can reasonably be explained by discursive norms. And we can easily say that in the target culture, it is appropriate to use this particular form. One of my students, who was Ethiopian, went into one of these clinics where mothers bring small babies, and the nurse was being very frustrated and said, you know, I don't understand. They don't do what we tell them to do. I tell the mother to come back in a month, and she doesn't come back. And my student said, look, let me interpret for her. <clears throat> the nurse says, come back in a month. And the interpreter says, count four Sabbaths and come back. And sure enough, the woman comes back. And she explains, yes, they, she doesn't have a concept of a month to know how to. But if you tell her to count four Sabbaths, you can't miss. And sure enough, it works. So these are examples of discursive norms and cultural norms and so on, which make perfect sense. However, the next examples that I'm going to be showing you are far more controversial than these ethical dilemmas. Again, the usefulness of researching these. So first we go back again to uh, each time I want to bring at least one article from way back to show you that we haven't suddenly discovered wisdom this year. You know, it's, it's a gradual process, epistemological and so on, where we gradually discover knowledge. And this is an article from 1976, which we republished uh, Franz Bishop and I in the Interpreting Studies Reader in 2002, where Anderson tells us about the interpreter, his position in the middle has the advantage of power inherent in all positions which control scarce resources. A, language of two knowledge, uh, a knowledge of two languages is a scarce resource in these settings. The interpreter's role is always partially undefined. That is, the role prescriptions are objectively inadequate. And that is still as true now as it always was. And Tate and Turner, who are two scholars who study sign language interpreting, have written a very important article, which they end, it's called The Code and the Culture, it's from 1997, I think, which they end with this um, thought-provoking statement, it needs to be established during the education of interpreters that gray goes with the territory. Being able to act competently within the gray zone is an integral part of their professionalism. Anyone here who has practiced professional community interpreting knows that you cannot get an answer to the question of what should I do? But what should I do in this particular situation given this particular approach? And even then, there might be arguments. Okay? There is no clear answer because gray goes with the territory, which is what makes it so interesting but also so difficult. So let me give you some examples. Uh, all of these, uh, this one is from an article, most of them are from my own experience. A patient, Chinese speaking, who has gone to a doctor to ask whether she should have amniocentesis. The doctor has explained, the interpreter has interpreted, the patient has not understood. The, the, the patient says, I can't decide if I should have it. The doctor says, I can't decide for you. The patient goes home confused. Her lack of self-advocacy skills is problematic. And the interpreter says, I know I mustn't initiate information seeking or information giving, but I would have liked to. This is all wrong. Now, as an interpreter, if you go away feeling that this is all wrong, you're extremely uncomfortable. You feel like you haven't done your job right, even though by some definitions you have. Basically, she has followed the conduit model, the model of neutrality. She has done what she was supposed to do, and this was all right. But she feels it's all wrong because the patient is going home miserable and confused. By the alternative might be 
for the interpreter to say to the patient, just a minute, do you want to ask the doctor another question? Or would you like to ask the doctor to repeat his explanation? Or the interpreter might turn to the doctor and say, excuse me, doctor, I get the feeling that she hasn't quite understood what you said. Would you mind repeating? Or may I ask her if she would like some part of it repeated? These are the kinds of interventions which don't simply mean I'm not being neutral, but they mean, uh, according to Freire, I'm reducing the power gap a little bit by taking some initiative, but without totally replacing the patient. It's not as though she said to the patient, okay, look, I'll get the explanation for you now and I'll explain it to you outside in the waiting room. No, that would be patronizing, that would be wrong. But she would like to facilitate a smoother interaction because the patient doesn't have the tools. Perhaps it's a cultural thing to initiate that kind of information-seeking interaction. Whatever it is, the patient goes away confused and the interpreter feels it's wrong and she feels she should have done something else. Let's look at some other examples. I think that this one demonstrates what I mean by problematizing the position of the interpreter. Um, so we're told that interpreters make crucial decisions about the selection of information to communicate and so on. I'll move on. Okay, let's look at some other examples. These slides, as you see at the top, I put the doctor, in the middle is the interpreter, and at the right is the patient. And I just brought a few slides from different studies which show you the trickiness of the, what interpreters sometimes do. And I'm not necessarily justifying it, not at all. This is an interview with an elderly patient who's being interviewed for a cognitive assessment. It's known as the mini cognitive test for assessing cognitive facilities. And the um, interviewer, uh, occupational therapist, asks in Dutch, uh, it's, yeah, it's Spanish and Dutch, another question about the time. Which season is it? That's an open question. What does the interpreter say? Which season is it? Which season? The seasons. There are four seasons in the year. That is spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Which season are we now? Okay, here we have an interpreter who is helping the patient. But by helping the patient, she is altering the whole discourse pattern. And she's basically enabling the patient to answer the question which she might not have been able to answer if it had remained an open question. So in a sense, she is perhaps also shifting the diagnosis and doing a disservice to the diagnostician and to the patient. This happens all the time because we want to help. So advocacy is a double-edged sword. We have to know where, where help becomes interference. Here's another example from an article by Claudia Angelelli of California. Can you ask her about chronic illnesses, diabetes, all that? Doctor says, all that. And the interpreter in Spanish asks the woman, has a doctor ever told you, even 20 years ago, here or there, you had diabetes, that you had high blood pressure, that you had heart disease, that you suffered from liver problems, kidney problems, stomach problems? Now, this is all the interpreter, okay? Now, I would say that the interpreter here is overstepping the boundaries, but I would also say that the healthcare provider, both here and in the previous example, should have noticed that a very short question was eliciting a very long <laughs> interaction, and the provider, the doctor, should have said, just a minute, let's take this a question at a time. The doctor should be asking these questions, not the interpreter. So there's a kind of collaboration in the negative sense of that word between doctor and interpreter. Or another example, this one not quite so bad, this is from Hebrew, does he know what date it is today? Of course, the provider should ask, do you know what date it is today? Should be the second person, but that's another issue. So the interpreter asks, and the um, patient says yes, and the interpreter says, well, what is the date? And uh, the date I forgot. And the interpreter says, don't worry, it's not so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of nice. And then she does the right thing. She reflects to the provider, and she says, I told him it's not so terrible. So the provider says, good for you. <laughs> this is a, you see all these intermediate stages. There's, there's so much gray with this territory. There's so much that isn't clear in terms of how far you can go. And there's such a need on the part of the interpreter to help the patient, to comfort the patient, to show solidarity with the patient. And sometimes it's appropriate, but sometimes, as in uh, the first example, it isn't appropriate. And that's where we need to use our discretion. Here's an example 
clear, clear example again from the literature. You have patients who are Jehovah's Witnesses. I know they're not allowed to get a blood transfusion, but the doctor says, when the time comes, if the patient is liable to die without the transfusion, we're going to do it anyway. But you tell them it's okay. In other words, you lie on our behalf. Now basically, the interpreter, being useful, if the doctor says to the patient, it's okay, we won't give you a transfusion. That's what the interpreter should say. But look what a, an impossible predicament the interpreter is in. Um, and uh, what is the right thing to do? Well, Ray goes with the territory, and it's really up to you, your conscience, your ideology to make that decision. I imagine most of us would say, excuse me, doctor, I'm not comfortable telling the patient something which is obviously not true. But the doctor might say, this is what I would tell him even if I spoke his language. So who are you to overrule what I want to tell the patient? That's what's known in English as damn if you do and damn if you don't. <laughs> and now I'd like to show you some examples from the reports of my students in this course that I described to you. I have, I think, about 10 minutes. That should wind it up more or less. Um, the first example brings in yet another consideration, which I haven't mentioned so far, but it's extremely important, especially in terms of language policy, which is institutional constraints. It's all fine and well to say, we know what should be done. We want to help minority populations. We have the two languages. We're willing to work at very reasonable conditions or perhaps to volunteer. All we want to do is to come in there and give, our, give the service. But what if the hospital doesn't want you? Or what if they say, okay, well, if you're here, would you please take this to the lab and would you please file these reports? And would you stay with the patient until this family arrives? And all sorts of things that really are not part of your job description by any stretch of the imagination. And you say to yourself, this institution is abusing me. Very often, there are institutional constraints that have to do with budget, with fatigue, with manpower, and so on, which we are victims of. Here's an example. A student of mine, was in the hospital, and he had four patients in four, there were ten rooms, uh, and four patients from Gaza who speak only Arabic, and he's an Arabic interpreter. And he says, I knew that if the doctors followed their usual pattern for making the rounds, going from room one to room nine in sequence, two of my patients would wind up without an interpreter because I have to leave soon. My two patients were in room seven and nine. I suggested a different arrangement, but the nurse told me not to interfere with their routine. Okay, he goes up to the head nurse and he says, look, excuse me, but there are two patients in room seven and room nine, and by the time the doctors get there, I will have left, so they won't have an interpreter. And the nurse says, well, you're not going to tell us how to do the doctor's rounds. We go in order. Okay? This is a typical example of an institutional constraint that clashes directly with what the interpreter thing is, thinks is the appropriate thing to do. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he left, and they didn't get an interpreter. Basically, it shows a very important aspect, which is that the staff needs to be trained. Not only the interpreters need to be trained, the staff needs to be made aware of what interpreting is all about. It's not that they're all mean. They really don't understand why it should matter that this guy should be there when the doctors come. And it needs to be explained. A one-hour lecture would be certainly much better than nothing, although, of course, a longer course would be better. The fact that the staff, the institutional powers that be, usually know nothing about interpreting is tremendously det detrimental to us. Here are a few other examples from reports. My students have to submit a report each week about what they did. Um, the nurse asked the doctor to be tested for HIV, and the mother started, and the nurse asked the mother to be tested for HIV, and the mother started crying. The nurse asked me to explain to her that it was a standard procedure and that I shouldn't be worried. She shouldn't be worried or offended. So I took her aside and explained it until she found out. Maybe this isn't something I should be doing, but I felt it was the right way because nobody else could have done it. So these are kind of, this is a gray territory where I think we're pretty comfortable with what the student writes. But strictly speaking, it was a much more flexible interpretation of his role than the classical conduit model. A lot of them write things like, people expect me to solve their problems. And I keep trying to explain, I'm just the interpreter. Especially when it's over the phone. A lot of times they want me to explain what their rights are. They all have problems and they all want me to help them solve them. It's really tough not being able to help them. And very often uh, people come in to these student interpreters who are sitting, let's say, uh, with a settlement officer or whatever. They say, well, what do you think I should write here? 
uh, how much income should I write here? Uh, those kinds of things. But of course the student says, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't know, whatever. But people look at the interpreter as the authority, and the interpreter is the one person who speaks their language, so they also get upset at the interpreter who isn't willing to help them. Um, this is just, I won't read the whole thing, but this is just a student who says, my problem was that the clerk was very condescending towards my client, and it made me very angry. So finally I told her off. I know I wasn't supposed to do that, but I couldn't stand the way she was talking. Okay, she's going with this Filipino worker to get some money, and the clerk is really nasty, and there we are. Clearly she has overstepped the balance of her role, but she's human, and she simply overreacted. This is a very controversial example, I think. A mother and her 14-year-old son arrived. This is at the hospital, emergency ward. He's been hit by a rocket. And she's from Gaza, and she speaks only Arabic. And she told me what had happened. And then she said, the Jews, with one hand they kill you, and with the other hand they save lives. And the doctor asked me, what did she say? And I answered, oh, she just explained what happened. And I didn't tell her that I Go deal with that on a conduit model basis. <laughs> the easiest thing would be to explain, to, try, to interpret what she said, right? Which probably would have been okay. I mean, the doctor may or may not have been upset by it, but so what? But the student chose not to interpret, which ostensibly means that she chose not to do her job right. But I would argue that when this woman, this mother of the 14-year-old son, um, saw this interpreter, who roughly looked like her, spoke her language, was from the same religion, more or less someone that she could identify with, and here she is in this very strange and overwhelming environment where she doesn't speak the language and she knows nobody. She was so relieved to have someone that she could vent her frustration and her anger and her fear to, that she made this statement. She wasn't directing it at the doctor. She was basically directing it at the interpreter, just you know, venting. And I think the interpreter was right not to interpret it. But this is a position that not everyone would agree with. And we had a big discussion of it in class, of course, and many quite a few of the students said, but you have to interpret it. She said it, you have to interpret it. So Ray goes with the territory. Okay. This is um, a Muslim interpreter, a young female student, who's interpreting for a man a husband uh, who's been uh, meeting with the doctor, and the doctor is telling the couple that the woman should not get pregnant in the, in the next year because it would endanger her health. And he's very upset, and he doesn't want to accept this um, demand. And then he turned to me and said, if they don't understand because they're from a different culture, you at least should understand. Whose side are you on? You should tell my wife to obey her husband. That's when I had to speak up and say I was there as an interpreter. And my job was to try just to transmit information, not to introduce my personal opinion. I don't know if I did the right thing, but I think that's what we did. Okay? Yet another pressure situation. Um, I'll come back to the whole notion of usefulness, but I hope the notion of usefulness emerges from these, because as we study these examples, if nothing else, we see how complex the job of a community interpreter can be. Another example. The nurse told the doctor that the mother had given her daughter a double dose of insulin by mistake. The doctor looked at me and asked why I hadn't said anything. The mother had told me about it in the waiting room, but she hadn't said anything about it to the doctor, so I didn't say anything either. These are the situations that community interpreters confront quite often. They sit outside in the waiting room with the patient. The patient tells them all sorts of things, patient or client, whatever the case may be. The patient may say something like, well, that doctor told me to stop smoking. I'm not going to stop smoking. And then they go inside and the doctor says, stop smoking, right? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, okay. So, this mother had not said anything to the doctor, so the interpreter didn't say anything, even though she knew. Should she say anything? Shouldn't she say anything? Personally, I think, at the very most, she could say to the mother kind of quietly, do you want to tell the doctor what you told me outside? But I don't think she should be the one to volunteer the information if the mother isn't volunteering the information. But, you know, some people may say, yes, but the child's going to die if this happens again. In other words, there are, there's quite a lot at stake here. And, okay, so much for some dilemmas, and really in a nutshell, I have about 4,000 of these reports of students, so I've just chosen a few. 
if they submit one each week and they go for 25 weeks, and this has been going on for six years with about 30 students each year, so we'll do the math. But it's amazing how each week the reports present me with new examples of how complex this world can be. Okay? Not a single week goes by when I don't see several examples where I say, oh my God, I'm glad I wasn't the interpreter in this situation because it's really such a challenge. Um, the client, how does the client perceive community interpreting? This, again, I'm giving you just a, an example, one slide, to say, yes, we say that we are there to help the client, but maybe the client doesn't want us. Maybe the client, as in this case, said, if I need to take someone, my friend goes with me. He doesn't charge me any money, and if I need a hospital appointment, my son-in-law goes with me, and if I need to fill in a form, he does that for me. He has a car, he takes me by car, he brings me back. I prefer to take someone with me whom I know. It's better for me. Okay, this is someone who said, I don't want an interpreter provided by the state. So there is something to be said for studying the client's perceptions. I won't go into it, but it does affect how we allocate interpreters and what kinds of interpreters. Maybe certain populations have a different approach than others. Some populations, which are very small, don't want an, uh, a paid interpreter because they're afraid that this person will tell someone else the whole confidentiality issue. Uh, whereas if the community is very, very large, that's less likely to happen. There are all sorts of um, parameters that have to be taken into account. And the provider, the provider's perceptions. This is a very sad but very real example. A 20-year-old woman, a recent immigrant, was stabbed to death by her ex-husband. Police concluded that the woman had endangered herself by failing to comply with police requests to wait at the station for police to take her home after she filed her complaint. All steps to prevent harm to the victim were taken. She was asked not to leave the station without being accompanied by police, but she got up and left. Why did she get up and leave? Because she didn't speak the language. She was asked in a language that she didn't understand, you sit here and we'll take you home. And they used the Hebrew word for a police car, which is a word that a new immigrant certainly wouldn't know. And they said, the police car will take you home. The woman didn't understand. Presumably, this is what we can only infer because Next thing they found out was that she had gone home and her husband had killed her. So this is the provider of the, the state or whatever telling her basically, well, you failed to comply, not telling her, telling us, that she failed to comply with requests, but having so little insight into the fact that if you want someone to comply with a request, the first thing you have to do is say it in the language that they understand. These are the providers. Very often the provider, I'm almost finished. Uh, very often the provider will say something like, We'll say to the interpreter, okay, you choose your word in Russian, five letters. The provider is doing a diagnostic test, and instead of doing it herself, she says to the interpreter, you do it, I'll get it. and then the interpreter administers the test. I'm just mentioning this briefly, because this is another aspect of how the provider sees the role of the interpreter. And this is very tricky, because if I need to do a diagnostic test to someone in one language, but that person doesn't speak the language, and I say to the interpreter, okay, ask her to give me something that rhymes with hello. But in her target language, maybe hello isn't a word that rhymes with anything. So of course you need to find a different kind of word with a different kind of rhyme. And you can't just do it on the square of the moment. You need to reconsider. Ask her to give me a six-letter word and spell it backwards. No, ask her to spell the word table backwards. It's a five-letter word. Well, maybe in her language it's an eight-letter word. So these are things that interpreters need to take into account, but providers don't know it. They need to be trained to understand that languages aren't just, you know, it's amazing how people who don't deal with language don't realize how complicated language is. Or another example, the doctor says to the interpreter, you start asking him questions. And the interpreter says, no, no, you ask the questions and I'll interpret. This is an actual recorded dialogue between doctor and uh, interpreter. Or he doesn't exactly know what we're talking about, does he? The doctor is asking the interpreter to do a cognitive assessment, basically, of the patient. And the interpreter says, well, um, it's, uh, it's a little difficult. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor to decide. But as far as I can tell, he doesn't seem focused. She shouldn't even be saying this. She doesn't have the diagnostic abilities to say whether the patient is focused or not. All the more substances is over the phone. Mm -hmm. But basically, the providers assume, on the one hand, that the interpreters are transparent, but on the other hand, they want them to do most of the work. So these are dilemmas that we come across all the time. Research. This is supposed to be about usefulness to research. Research. Well, I just want to remember, I'm doing this very briefly because I was told to end the 11 and we're a little bit past the 11. 
First of all, I'm referring to this article by my colleague Yves Mambier um, in Meta, it's in French, the article. Um, and it talks about research and its relevance to translation scholars in general and to interpreting scholars among others. And I think it's a useful article for those of you who are interested in social relevance. In particular, he focuses on what's known as action research. And Franz Blechhecker says and makes the point with which I will end that it's not just about research, it's about development. It's not R, but D, the kind of development work that is done when interpreting scholars participate in committees or interdisciplinary working groups of projects designed to change a given social practice. If we go out and participate in human rights NGOs and in hospitals and in government organizations and try to create all sorts of links between academia and community, we're stepping beyond our researcher role and becoming developers, practitioners, in a way, contributors to the work of policymakers. Is this our role? Well, that's a philosophical question. It's a political question. And many of us in academia would be much more comfortable, most of us would be much more comfortable staying in the library and doing research. But the real world needs a closer interface between research and what we do and what's happening out there, because so much is happening out there, as I hope I demonstrated to you with some of those uh, slides. So research alone may not matter enough to shape the largely underdeveloped situation on the ground. Interpreting scholars need to publish in journals of disciplines that underpin the relevant social practice and to complement their research by collaborative development in order to secure a certain impact. So if we want to have an impact, if we want to be useful in today's world, we need to be researching the process and the product and the social interaction and the discourse norms and the constraints and the strategies and all the other things that I mentioned. We need to bear in mind that gray goes with the territory. And we need to know that in such development efforts, it's not interpreting studies that matters, but the people who promote and leverage its findings in social contexts, ideally by moving towards collaborative research, collaborating with people within translation studies and beyond in policy making, in government, in sociology, in psychology, uh, and so on. And one of the ways of doing it is through participatory action research, which I won't go into now, but those of you who are interested, it's a very important form of research that can be particularly useful because it involves constantly engaging with those whom we serve with our practice. There are many other issues to explore which I don't have time to go into, such as vicarious effects on community interpreters and, and so on and so forth, gender, human rights legislation, uh, how to train, etc., etc., children of immigrants as language brokers. These are another 10 or so topics that could be discussed. But of course, the list of topics is endless, and each of you could add a few more. So there's no point in trying to exhaust the whole list before I exhaust you. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. 
and so it kind of puts you in an invidious position because um, there is, you know, you're also under the, you have this feeling that the service provider is your boss as well in this kind of relationship. Maybe not. Maybe that's where we need to, we may need to interrupt you at this point mm -hmm. and say, okay, who is the boss? Yeah. For one thing, the service provider is not the person who's hired you, not the person who's paying you, normally. But rather, he himself is, he or she, is working for an institution which has brought you in uh, very often as a volunteer or as a paid employee. Um, if we were to cite some of what Daniel Simone wrote about interpreters or translators, subservience, invisibility, transparency, and so on, we would find that we tend, in that situation to describe, to lean too far, I think, in the direction of being subservient. Why can I not say to the provider, excuse me, I'm the interpreter, I'll be glad to interpret anything you say, but I cannot explain the form, I myself don't understand this form, and in any case I might make a mistake and then we'll both be sued for now back. So if I wouldn't be, I wouldn't put it right that way, but the point is, I would try to educate. I constantly, I find the one most frustrating aspect of this whole discussion is that the service givers are not educated. And we need to educate them in some small way. Another way of doing it is before every interaction, if at all possible, unless it's a total emergency, you say, excuse me, just before we begin, if I may have half a minute of your time, I just want to explain, I'm the interpreter, I'll interpret everything you say, I won't, um, uh, um, you know, and, and give a little spiel about how, how, uh, what your role is, um, you know, just a few words. And, um, and preferably also find a good position in which to sit or stand so that you can see them properly and hear them properly. So in the example you gave, I would simply uh, explain. You actually just answered my, what I was going to raise, the question about whether there should be an established protocol at the beginning of any uh, interpreter. Definitely. There definitely uh, should be an established protocol. Our students are taught to use it. Sometimes they remember, sometimes they forget. Of course, if it's a provider who's used an interpreter hundreds of times, you don't need to repeat it, but you need to repeat for a patient. So yes, there definitely should be. It saves so much anguish later on. I manage medical interpreters in a hospital, and um, all the interpreters we work with, staff and contract interpreters, are tested and trained, and they absolutely give the introduction in two languages, setting the ground rules, and it really saves a lot of time and explanation. So when we say, I'll interpret everything said, including any comments directed to me, mm -hmm. right? And it, it really helps get through, so if, if the doctor makes um, an inappropriate remark, that comes out in the other language. You say something like, these people, you know how they always... Yep, yep. <laughs> and then, oh, I didn't expect you to interpret that. I told you I have to interpret to everything said. Right. It's, yeah. First of all, what you're describing is to me, utopia. <laughs> it's as it should be. It's not an ounce more than what should be. This is exactly what should be. Clearly established, people are trained, people are paid, there's a proper procedure, there's a protocol, the protocol is as it should be. But to me it's utopian because unfortunately where I come from, we have none of this. It's all ad hoc. It's all kind of, you know, um, fly by the seat of your pants and just do the rest of the time. Which is very unfortunate, that's what we're working on. We in academia are working to change that in the direction of what you already have. So what you said has proven to me, or uh, if proof be needed, that this is the direction we should be going. Okay. Well, for, for patient safety and for organizational liability both. Yep, definitely. I mean, we have people who are risk management specialists and all that. But they fail to see the connection between inadequate interpreting and the next malpractice suit. Unfortunately, there are very, very, very few malpractice suits based on inadequate interpreting. In a way, I, I wish there were more. Because if there were more, this would put the fear of God in it. Somehow, <laughs> I think this will help. Well, it's, things aren't going to change until there's a mandate on the part of governments to use qualified interpreters in sensitive settings like healthcare, legal settings, outside of courts, and so on. And uh, somebody's going to get hurt, unfortunately, yeah. in order for things to change. Yeah, well, that's why I started with language policy, because that's really where it begins. Absolutely, you're right. Yes. Uh, gray zone and that for 
that gray zone and that subjectivity of the interpreter. Um, in, in Toronto, while we do have some uh, official spaces like hospitals, which predominantly gives qualified interpreters, it's also still very possible to be in a situation um, like you may be familiar with where it's ad hoc and it's not, you're not dealing with qualified interpreters or where the interpreter may be um, more likely to advocate on behalf of the, the patient or the client as opposed to being neutral. So when we're talking about language policy, how do we, um, when we're trying to influence that policy in terms of language and rights, which uh, sort of, which space do we turn to? Uh, do we rely on, because we can't have it both, right, when we're talking about, we can't have uh, official policy, we can't have the interpreter be both advocate and, and neutral. Or can we? I think you're asking two separate questions, but maybe I misunderstood you. First of all, where do we do our own preaching or advocacy work to persuade policymakers to make the whole scene better? And that, I think, is, is how political do you get? And um, I think from the little that we got to chat, and I know about myself as well, we tend to go in that direction, to be out there and trying to change policy. In terms of what do we tell policymakers, what kind of role shall we play, I don't think you really need to discuss this with the policymakers. Basically, you say that you want to be a highly qualified professional interpreter and to do your job as you consider the most appropriate. There are so many nuances, exactly, where it goes with the territory, and you cannot give them a neat list of what you're going to do. It just won't work. So if you say, I'm going to be an advocate for everyone who walks into this office, that is not going to work. If you just say, I'm going to do my job as professionally as possible, leave it to their imagination and to your own imagination to figure out what you're going to do in every given situation. So it's possible to have different roles for different... Right. It's impossible roles. not to have different roles. And Greg goes with the character. I think that's, a, that's the message. And that's why it's such an incredibly challenging task. I'm always amused or bewildered at the fact that we who do conference interpreting, which is what I do most of the time, we who have once been called by one of my colleagues, the boost gentry. <laughs> <laughs> outrageous sounds. People get pampered and we won't even come to work unless you first put the water in our booth and you make sure the ventilation is just right and, and, and you give us the material in advance, blah, blah. We are looked upon, you know, it's such a prestige in terms of habitus, our habitus. We have this image of ourselves as masters of knowledge and power and wisdom and whatnot. The community interpreter has a much harder job. But the prestige value is way down, and the challenges are enormous. So there's something really wrong about that, because what you described and what I responded basically amounts to a situation where every time you're in an interaction, to stop and think and debate with yourself and get into emotional turmoil and conflict and whatnot, it's much tougher than sitting in a booth interpreting some academic uh, presentation. <laughs> Thanks for that acknowledgement. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the floor? <laughs> <laughs> I just have a situation that I'd like to pose. I'd be curious what your opinion is. Um, I have to repeat the question. I don't think it can be heard over there. Sorry, I'll try to speak up. Um, so I was interpreting in Ecuador last year um, for an NGO from Edmonton. And, um, who were bringing orthopedic surgery to um, people that wouldn't otherwise have access to the surgeries. Um, and so my role was a person to on behalf of the doctors and on, and on behalf of the patients as well. Um, but moreover, I felt like my role was to talk to people, um, to simply um, put people at ease. These are people coming from small villages to the city for the first time, um, dealing with um, Canadians uh, with whom they've never dealt with before, and, uh, and in many cases just quite worked up and, and anxious. Um, I'd be curious whether you think that that is legitimate for the interpreter to take people's time to just talk. Okay, to sum up the question, uh, you've been to Ecuador interpreting for villagers who come in for surgery, and you felt that your role beyond interpreting was over to talk to them, to put them at ease, etc. Et what, what do I think about it? First of all, they were happy, you were happy, the providers were happy, you did no harm, so let's start out by saying why not. Yes, it's not, or no, it's not in the job definition. Doesn't it make sense? If people have come in and they're bewildered, and, they're, and you have the time to sit with them and talk to them, and you speak their language, 
and they are very frightening, and you can put them at ease. It's like the slide I showed you about the guy who says that the mother was asked to do this HIV test and she was so worried, and I sat with her and I explained to her that this is a routine procedure. Mm -hmm. Why not? Which is why I think the role definition, not only does the gray go with the territory, but the role definition has to be expanded and has to be subject to circumstances. And the circumstances that you explained, it makes perfect sense to sit there and talk to them, if at all possible. So that's my take on it. Someone else who has a more conservative approach to role definitions might disagree. You know, maybe this man will. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess this is not this more of a comment than a question. I agree with the whole, um, like, less of those solid boundaries of the role definitions because I guess like an interpreter is intrinsically a position of an interruption. Right? It interrupts a traditional. Um, relationship between what's traditionally two people speaking, right? So why can't you interrupt it with something? Well, the question is, what is the something? Yes, you interrupt it with something, but is the something simply the, uh, the target language equivalent of what the source language said? Or is the something something like, oh, don't listen to what this doctor tells you, it's, it's no good. You know, it can range from very neutral to very outrageous. I haven't even mentioned, it's one of my many topics, mental health interpreting. In a mental health setting, when you have an interpreter in the middle, just think what that does to transference and counter-transference, I and mean, we're talking of interrupting and being present. That's a whole subject of itself, which I haven't gone into. But yes, the interpreter is always a third, you know, a fifth wheel or a third party or an interruption. So the idea is to make the interruption as unobtrusive as possible, but as appropriate as possible. And often unobtrusive and appropriate seem like an oxymoron in some of the situations that I've described. So yes, you're right. Okay. Uh, I have just a little um, kind of uh, question. Uh, I think Anthony had a, uh, a, a, a paper about how to use transmission as a risk management um, kind of process or situation. Do you see that, and since interpretation intersects a lot with um, uh, translation, uh, from what like, the, the examples you have shown, do you think it is important to highlight that kind of theory or direction that it is uh, like part of the job or the whole definition is to avoid risks, avoid some kind or of... To handle or to handle it. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for that point. Yes, uh, Anthony Pym's uh, article on risk management, which is a landmark article, um, is very appropriate for everything I was speaking about, in fact. In fact, I should have had a slide after TSIS interface. That would have been a very appropriate slide for me to add, which I think I will. Risk management in both of them. Absolutely. In interpreting studies, in a sense, the risk is even more immediate and more apparent than in translation, where often it's a very delayed reaction. So absolutely, you're right. Thank you for that. Time for coffee, I think. We have to wrap up and uh, grab a Thank you.